Good morning, friends. Hope everyone's doing all right on this fine Saturday morning. We are back to it with our Necrons. Gonna try and finish them up today. Got myself a nice lukewarm pot of coffee. Some goblin green. And let's get to it. So the wash last time left uh, something to be desired in terms of coverage. Oh, good morning, Merlin. <laughs> yes, get yourself some coffee. It's way too late in the morning not to have had any at this point. We're going to go ahead and... Mix up some goblin green contrast and see if that doesn't give us a nice thick effect. There we go. I think that's a nice color. So let's go ahead and Give this a test on the orb. How's the audio right now? Not too loud? Great. I'm uh, in the Detroit area, which is pretty generic to say, but uh, if you uh, have a good sense of direction for the area, I'm uh, pretty close to like this Lake St. Clair sections right on the east coast. So not right in the uh, city, but pretty close. There we go. I think that uh, green really fits well. Has a nice sort of ethereal glow to it. State fairgrounds. Can't say I remember where exactly those are. There is a lot of Detroit to see. I still haven't seen most of the area. People keep telling me I need to go check out Eastern Market, and I say, yeah, I'll get to it. It's been uh, a few years now, and I still haven't made the trip out, but I'll get there eventually. I think we're going to give this guy's scythe a nice green treatment, give it a little bit of a ethereal energy look. I was actually really disappointed in myself this year, speaking of fairs, 
that uh, I was so busy working on it other projects that I didn't get around to going to the Renaissance Fair this year. Doesn't help that they're only open for like six weekends total, but used to go all the time back before uh, everything changed. Oh yeah, Renaissance Fair is always a good time. Crazy to think that's been uh, almost three years now. Oh yeah, I've been out to Ferndale a few times. Uh, I think it's only about 20 minutes away from me off uh, 696 there, if I'm remembering correctly. And while we let that dry, we'll go back over here to our immortals. Give their... I don't remember if these are Goss Blasters or Flayers, but these tubes need a good greening. <laughs> yeah, we seem to be everywhere. When I was living down in Texas for a while, I was amazed by the number of people I would meet who were from the same area of Michigan as I. Like, I'd, uh, I grew up in the Thumb, and I was just out at a bar one day talking to somebody, and he asked me where I'm from, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm from uh, Port Huron. And he's like, no kidding, I'm from Marysville. Towns literally, you know, ten minutes away from each other. Tiny towns, you know. Like, my home city, at best, has 25,000 people in it. And just to find, you know, what are effectively city expats like that, you know, 1,500 miles away. <laughs> the world's so much smaller than you think. Yeah, it's timeless like this, I wish I were ambidextrous. Because getting in on these angles is pain. It's just such a nice effect to see that green glow going off from these uh, plasma tubes. And I think I might even come back later with an even thinner glaze and uh, kind of slop it around the edges of metal here to make it look like it's glowing onto it. Or maybe I'll do that with the airbrush. Either way, object source lighting is an amazing effect it's just a pain to do so i don't usually do it but with these guys eh, they're kind of feeling a little special to me and of course we've got to slop some onto these tubes here
So are you working on any crafts right now there, Merlin? We're just chilling out on this uh, wonderful Saturday. Yep. Am I even on the camera? Should probably be checking that more. Fun, fun. Saturdays for me mean dinner with the grandparents, which is always nice. Oh dear. I stayed up a little too late uh, watching streams and playing Vermintide since that's free right now. Doesn't help that I've got insomnia, but you know. Yeah, that'll do it to you. Back when I played WoW, it was uh, uh, unhealthy how much I played. Uh, sounds like somebody's delivering something. Excuse me one second while I go get my dog. Sorry about that. Miller is just such a protective little boy. God forbid a mailman ever come to our door. It was funny, I uh, used to have a chain link fence gate from my backyard and for various reasons I decided uh, to convert it into a full privacy fence gate and the first day after I put that gate up the uh, male lady it comes up to me and says oh thank you so much for putting that gate up he looks like a real killer and I just laughed and told her oh he's only barking because the gates in the way he wants you to give him a butt rub And I think that's 99% of the case here, is that, oh my god, this door's in the way, at, and they're not giving me rubs.
Yep. Miller's just a big old softy. All bark and no bite. One really nice, or one of the many nice things about painting Necrons here is since most of their bits are glowy, even though I'm not really dexterous enough to do face details well, all of that uh, green that's spilling out of their eyes uh, just looks like glow. Just some nice glowy little eyes. I think that guy's looking pretty good. We'll let him dry off a bit and see if we need to touch him up more. That move right on along. While I clean my brush, hydration and posture check for everyone.
And I tell you, I get the most pings on Discord. While I am, uh, painting. The Merlin shrimp is delicious. Hey, Randus. We are finishing up some Necron Immortals and an Overlord that I started on uh, Thursday there. So that day we got the uh, we got the base coat down after doing a whole bunch of washing and underpainting. And then uh, we did a little bit of details with copper. Now we're going in through and adding the green plasma glow. <laughs> or we could paint Randus, I guess. I don't think I'm the best painter, but if anybody does want to, you know, hire me for commissions, uh, I won't say no. Oh, you didn't hear, Randus? Yeah, um, Biden made a deal with the uh, Catan uh, Star Gods, uh, and he's converted converting all of uh, America into uh, robots. Honestly, it's not the worst deal. We lose our soul, but we become immortal. So, uh, yeah, could be worse. <laughs> oh, so you're uh you're a member of the cult of Slanesh there, uh, Merlin. That certainly paints you in a different light. So, uh, in Warhammer 40k, and, uh, well, even Warhammer itself, because they share the same Chaos Gods, there are the four great ruinous powers. There are smaller Chaos Gods, but there are the four main ones. You've got the oldest, uh, who is Nurgle. He is the god of death, pestilence, and rot. Uh, basically, he was born the second living beings with a soul were born as well because at our heart every um living sentient being fears death so he embodies that but at the same time he's a force of mm, stability i'd say so one thing to keep in mind is all chaos gods have good and bad aspects to them even though they're evil in a sense then you've also got zinch who is the god of change and magic corn who is the god of uh violence uh all about that blood and war but you know likes his honor uh and then the final god who was uh birthed most recently 
uh, was Soil Anesh, who is the god of excess. Um, basically, space elves became so hedonistic that their psychic powers manifested a brand new god. Uh, and the god is uh, into a lot of kinky things, but they also strive for perfection in all things. So uh, they tempt artists a lot with the idea that they can become the best artist. Um, you know, the masters of their craft. But they also, you know, it's uh, it's very much the sex, drugs, and rock and roll uh, god of the universe. The other fun thing about Slanesh is that uh, while um, the other three gods are traditionally masculine coded, you know, you've got Grandfather Nurgle, you've got Korn, which is just a very angry demon man, you've got Zinch, which is sort of unknowable, but he still goes by he him. Slanesh is fluid, I would say. Uh, they will appear as whatever you are most interested in. So everybody sees Slanesh differently. Uh, and so some people will just uh, refer to them with the pronoun Shem, which is she, he, and them all in one. But very much uh, the traditional uh, depiction of Slaneshi demons is... Oh, there's a word for it. It's the alchemical idea of um, a hermaphrodite, one half of the body being a man and one half being woman. So, you know, on their left side, they'll have breasts. On their right side, uh, abs, you know, sort of deal. It's, uh, like I said, it kind of goes back to that kinkiness. They're very open about themselves. That being said, I am giving you the uh, best outlook on it. At the end of the day, they are still a chaos god, and there are some very negative aspects to being uh, a member of that cult. So since they are pleasure seekers, they, um, they actually have their nervous system dulled to the point where uh, I, women can have abs, Randis, and I personally love women with abs, but, you know, they, uh, the way they depict them is the male side is very muscular, very masculine, while the feminine side is very smooth and curvaceous. Let's not pretend, uh, that... Games Workshop has ever been a good egalitarian representation of the world. But, um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, the, uh, the faithful of Slanesh, because their, uh, nerves and sensitivities have been dialed way down, they have to seek the most extreme versions of any stimulation. They have to, you know, 
perform horrible acts of self-mutilation just to feel any pain. They have to turn their music up to, you know, if you've got an amp that goes from 1 to 10, they have to turn it up to 20. They actually have a group of warriors called the uh, Noise Marines who u literally use sonic weaponry designed to cause pain and suffering in their enemies because of how loud and disorientating it is. And it is an eternal shame that they do not have any current uh, noise marine models, because I just really want to rock into battle with a... Uh... So the noise marines belong to the Emperor's children, whose color scheme used to be purple and gold, but after their corruption became pink and gold. So I just want to rock up to a battle with a legion of pink and gold colored space marines all holding guitars and horns and loudspeakers on their backs just ready to have the biggest jam session possible <laughs> and commit acts of atrocity while they're at it I mean, even if you uh, don't get into the painting or the modeling or anything like that, the lore is just kind of fascinating, and it's been built up over the past, you know, 30 years, so there's a lot to digest. You know, hundreds of books, uh, lexicanum entries, all that good stuff, dozens of video games, and there's a little bit of something for everyone. You know, with uh, a dozen or so factions, there's bound to be somebody you like. Yeah, I'm, uh, no lie, if I had to serve any Chaos Gods, then that should probably be on my, uh, top of the list there. Tell me about it, Randus. For me, it's a lot of... I get that uh, depression anhedonia, where I hyper-focus on 
something for maybe two or three months and then all of a sudden I'm bored of it. So then I have to start something else. So I just keep a whole bunch of hobbies around so that when I get bored of, say, painting, I can go back to woodwork or weaving or crochet or something. Doesn't hurt that I've got enough of a disposable income that I can maintain all of these hobbies. It was definitely a lot harder to do back when I was uh, making diddly squat. At the very least, I try to stick with a hobby until I can say I'm happy with the results of what I'm doing. Now, I don't like uh, finishing or leaving things halfway done. Which is why I sort of turned into that Omni-Crafter. Because I want to at least get good at something before I drop it for a few months. And then when I do pick it back up and I'm rusty at it, it's uh, it's like that whole learning curve all over again, just a little shorter. Oh god, my Steam library is, uh, horrendous, to say the least. The number of games I've picked up through, like, Humble Bundles and Steam Sales that I've literally never touched. And then I just, uh, go ahead and pay, play the same game over and over again. One of my major issues is uh, picking things back up. If I start a project, I need to finish that project. If not in the same session, uh, then very soon after that, you know, in terms of days. Because the second I put it down and leave it for a week or two, my brain just tosses it right out. There have been uh, so many times that I have just completely restarted a campaign or something in a video game just because, well, it's been three weeks. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what quests I'm on. I need a recap or I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to start again. Uh, 
back when I played a lot more Civ was always my bane because I'd have a dozen half-finished save files and yet other times I would just spend the entire day playing a single game and hopefully completing it. I think it's actually uh, one of the main reasons that I fell off Final Fantasy XIV was I picked it up right at around the time of Chozu and Kei's uh, wedding inside the game. And a few months after that, Endwalker came out, and the queues were just so long that I did not have any interest in sitting in them, especially if I'd get disconnected. Um, so I stopped playing for a few weeks while that got sorted out, and then I just never picked it back up. I think I made it partially, partially into Heavensward. Gunbreaker was fun. I did enjoy it. But, I don't know. I'd need like a dedicated play partner or something to uh, get myself pulled back into it. Somebody to help me through the early levels. Hi, Merlin. Hi. How are you? Alright, I think I'm going to finish up this guy, and then we'll take a quick break, and see where we're at from there. I've also got a little bit of terrain to paint, and maybe some Chaos Space Marines we can take a look at if we finish up quickly. See you, Randus. Thanks for stopping in. Alright, well, with that, I think we're going to break. So, get up, stretch your legs, swap your fluids, all that good stuff, and we'll be back in five.
All right, we're back. Looks like I forgot about this little guy. So we'll finish up this one too. Cute pup, by the way, Merlin. Such a good sploot. Aw, that's a shame. I hope they feel better. Yeah, I, I've heard that a lot about kids. One of my coworkers has uh, a preschool aged daughter and the number of times he's been sick because of something uh, she's brought home, it's a bit nutty. One of the many reasons I am not planning on ever having kids. Do I think I'd be a cool uncle? Definitely. I'd be a terrible father. All right, you stay down, silly model. It's a generic measuring cup, but yeah, it's basically a medicine cup. They work in a pinch for mixing paints in bulk or uh, being used as stands. I've got... Uh, I decided to just order more of these wooden stands from the manufacturer instead of making my own because I was feeling lazy. And I figured they'd look nicer on stream. But currently only have four, so it doesn't exactly work when you've got five figures to paint. But this will get the job done. Just need somewhere good to grip. I think I bought a bulk package of like 500 of these little things for uh, all of eight dollars.
think I might have poured out just the right amount of paint. Because we're running low on the palette, but we're almost done with these sections, I think. It's kind of like thread chicken with the uh, SJ there. All right, let's see how the Overlord's doing. I think that scythe turned out pretty nice. I think I'm just gonna touch up a little bit of the back end here, give it a little bit of a darker green. So it stands out more. Yeah, I thought so. It's nice and uh, light green, but still desaturated enough that it doesn't look too out of place here relative to the shiny metal. Something else I think I'm going to do, I'm going to glaze over this copper just a bit with it. Make it look like it's a little bit of that plasma flowing out from the internal tubing. And kind of dull it down a bit.
There we go. We'll just look at these guys again, see if there's any areas that need a little touch up with some thin glaze. I think we're ready to go on to our next color. That is one of the more annoying aspects of batch planning. I don't know if I've said this already, but uh, basically having to be doing the same parts over and over again with the same colors, just so that everything's matching. It does get a little monotonous at times. That's why I typically actually enjoy painting D&D &D minis and just doing everything uniquely. Or working on just one big model. I mean, there is times where I want to just turn my brain off and assembly line something out, but... Other times I need uh, a little bit more dopamine than that. That thrill of doing something new. This guy didn't get his eyes. Glad we checked for that real quick. There we go. Stomach, stop growling. You had a sandwich two hours ago. So Merlin, if I were to get back into Final Fantasy, what uh, around what time do you play? Well, that would line up with my schedule, I suppose. Out of the country. Going on vacation? All right. Forgot about that. That'll be fun. Remind me again where exactly you're going? Ah, uh, yeah, Alberta. For some reason in my head it was either Alberta or Toronto, but I knew Toronto wasn't right. Because uh, that's just what I keep teasing y'all with, you know, halfway between uh, SJ and me is uh, Toronto. I've heard Toronto's an, or er, not Toronto, Alberta's an interesting place. 
very Texas like I've heard. Avoiding Toronto by going through Montreal it sounds like uh <laughs> lesser of two evils, certainly. Uh, you see, I didn't uh, want to be in the fire, so I jumped into the frying pan instead. <laughs> Can't beat the uh, economy. It's kind of sad. I think the last time I was in Canada was like, oh god, it will have been uh, like four years ago now at this point, when I went up for Magic the Gathering tournament in Toronto. Somehow, despite living right next to uh, Windsor, I haven't been there since. Really need to make a trip. Even if it's just to get some poutine. All right. So I think we're done with the Goblin Green for now. Let's see. This Oak Brown and Bone White I've got are mostly just for the terrain. One thing I want to try doing on these guys, even if it's just in some select places, is a bit of edge highlighting. And what that is, it's basically a very selective dry brushing where you use a lighter color on an edge to make it look like where the sunlight is glinting off of it. It's uh, not an easy technique by any stretch, especially with shaky hands, but you know what? We live for a little bit of excitement, don't we? <laughs> well, we're just gonna drop some of this bright silver on uh, my paper here. Load up my brush a little dryly. And we're gonna start Just with the bayonet face, and we're just gonna, using the body of our brush, gently, ever so slightly, slide it across the edge of the blade to try and just bring up the color value a little bit on it. And if this comes out poorly, who cares? Because I think overall these models are looking pretty good, so just a little bit of a defect won't hurt too much. But yeah, just using a very fine brush very thick paint so that we have a lot of control over it. It doesn't come off as easily as a washer glaze, just so that we can get oh so gentle edging. 
and it's a very light effect that we're doing right now because I'm not going too heavy on it, but you can kind of see how it's creating that bright edge. We're going to do the same on the underside of the blade too. Typically you'd save edge highlighting for top sides, but with this being a blade, I kind of want the, uh, the grind to show as sort of a highlight. So most people won't realize this, but in a blade, you actually have two different grinds. You've got your edge bevel and then your true grind. And uh, the bevel is just kind of there to help split things off and to work into the, uh, the true grind. Because like if you had just a flat rectangle and you were trying to grind a fine edge into that it'd be a pain you'd have to remove a lot more material every time you sharpened it so the bevel helps direct that thin it out beforehand but the true grind is a much sharper angle than even the bevel but you still see the bevel on the blade so you really want to paint that in to make it apparent that, you know, this is sharp. This is meant to be for cutting. Just gonna add a little bit of water to this brush because it's kind of feeling a little sticky right now. And while we want it to be dry and controlled, we still want to flow off. As with all things in miniature painting, it is a very delicate balance between your wets and your dries. How much pressure you put in, how much paint you have loaded onto your brush, all that good stuff. Which is honestly, I think, one of the most irritating parts of mini painting compared to other crafts you do, like... Um, Crochet, you know, you're talking about very fixed rules. You're talking about a tension level that can easily be measured. When I'm working on woodwork, I know exactly what the dimensions are supposed to be. I know exactly what angle the blade's supposed to come in. But painting is very much uh, what feels right at the moment, because there's just so much you can't fully control uh, how your paint comes naturally. Um, you know, what different effects you want. There's just so many variables that you have to account for that you can't account for, so you just have to do it by feel. Hey, Keld. Glad to see you, buddy. I'm doing good. We're just uh, finishing up some Necrons with a bit of edge highlighting. Got uh, some nice silver I'm putting over top of this greasy oil base coat that I did. This is my first time uh, edge highlighting, actually. Because 
Oh, it's a pain, but I think these uh, models deserve it. And we're just doing a very light edge highlight. Very gentle. So Keld, how are things going with the uh the travels there? Now you've been jumping uh around a bit lately. Words are hard. We don't have to worry about words here. But yeah, I feel that. Last time I was unemployed, it was only for about three months, I think. Two months, three months. But it did feel like an eternity. And it was excruciating every day. So I feel for you, bud. I hope things turn up soon. There we go. It's a very subtle effect, especially with how everything is uh, already very chromey and shiny. So it's hard to tell as much. But I do think it just makes it pop a little bit more.
Yeah, health is important. I definitely need to make more time for my physical and mental health. It's been way too long since I've seen a therapist. What do you think, Keld? How are these skelly boys looking to you? Glad you like it. I suffer from, uh, as most um, artists and crafters do, the perfectionism and knowledge of my mistakes, that I can never truly appreciate what I've created, unless it's something I'm absolutely proud of. So it's always nice having somebody else over my shoulder saying this looks great because sometimes you just really need that ego boost. Need somebody to keep you grounded to be like, no, 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 you're doing a good job. Don't worry about it. Takes me weeks to appreciate things I've done. 
got to completely disassociate myself from it and then come back when I've forgotten all the little mistakes I've made. It's either that or I've got to take my glasses off. It is kind of funny to me how much effort we put into the little details on these things. Like, when it's right up close to our face and you can see every little aspect of it. And then you get it to the tabletop and it's constantly three or four feet away from you and you can barely see anything. But on that note, this is a good time for me to take a quick break. So everybody... Get up, stretch your legs, refle refresh your fluids. I'm going to get a little bit of a uh, snack because my stomach's grumbling. And we'll be back in five minutes or so.
All right, and we are back. Made myself a fresh pot of uh, decaf tea. Slammed down a sandwich. And we're ready to get back to it. And the stream is scheduled for only 11 to 1, but I think I might go a little bit longer today. Just a bit. See if we can't finish these guys all up in one sitting. Hate to have to wait till Thursday to finish them up on stream. Help keep Merlin entertained since she can't hang out with her nephews right now. <laughs> Oh yeah? What art piece are you working on? If you don't mind me asking. I don't remember which one Patroclus is. Is he one of the um, old heroes? I'm fairly familiar with uh, Hades and Greek mythology. Just been a while. But either way, I'd love to see that when it, uh, love to see that when it's done. He died having put on Achilles' armor. Yeah, I do not remember that. Oh, right. Now I remember the, uh, his, basically his gay lover, but, you know, historians don't want to call them gay, uh, and it led to Achilles going on that rampage during the Battle of Troy. Yeah, now I remember. The classic, they were roommates. They're just really good pals. <laughs> just bros doing bro things, you know? There's a, a subreddit I like to hop into every now and then. I think it's like Sappho and her friend or something like that. Where it's just like a collection of memes about how various uh, historians and archaeologists and all that just adamantly refuse to acknowledge anything as gay in history. Oh, that's cute.
Yep, the swap to decap was a good idea. Really do not need to be buzzing all over the place today. Thinking about that uh, you know, gay history reminds me of, um, I want to say it was during or shortly after World War II, um, one of the top generals or top colonels of the U.S. Army, uh, this was very much during... Uh, Brain, work with me here. There was a bit of a panic about how many uh, gay people were in, like, the Navy and stuff like that. And they were trying to find, like, the source of all of it and all that. But uh, one of the colonels or generals told uh, one of his uh, secretaries, basically, that he wanted her help rooting out all of the lesbians in the auxiliary staff. Because, uh, you know, moral depravity and all that. And this uh, secretary closed the door to his office, came right up to his desk and said, Sir, if you root out all of the lesbians from this department, you will not only lose 60% of your highest ranking uh, clerical staff, you're going to lose me. And he immediately just, you know, shredded that order. Because when you think about it, yeah, if you're going to be a woman in the the armed forces in any role, you got a high chance. <laughs> I love those uh, pictures of, uh, like, women in uh, combat gear. And all of the other women just looking at him like, ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. Well, uh, it was funny, Keld. Um, so there was a slogan, or not a slogan, a saying at the time. Kind of like a shibboleth. Um... If you want to find out if somebody was gay secretly, you'd ask if it, they were a friend of Dorothy. Because the, you know, not long ago, the Wizard of Oz had just come out with uh, Judy Garland there. And, you know, Dorothy had uh, the Lion, the Tin Man, and the Scarecrow. And for a while there, they were kind of seen as gay icons because, like, three men palling around with a single woman and they're all just friends. Uh, so it was like, yeah, are you a friend of Dorothy? Are you uh, this uh, merry gay man? And the top brass of the military, not understanding that reference, not knowing the context of, are you a friend of Dorothy, thought there was a real-life woman named Dorothy that was organizing a gay infiltration of the army. <laughs> Yeah, the straights, uh, they're not always okay.
You know, Kelt, I'm still thinking about that comment you made there, the uh, resting podcast voice. And I guess I just don't uh, listen to enough podcasts to know what you mean by that. But I hope I'm still doing it all right for you there. Personally, never been a fan of... Uh, the sound of my own voice definitely sounds better rattling in my bones than it does through my ears. But as long as y'all are okay with it, that's all that matters. So a bit of that cadence is partially because of my ADHD. Um, if I don't stop and slowly think about what I want to say, it will all just kind of come out in a jumble. Or I'll trip over my own words. And I also try and avoid using um or ah uh or any of those other delay words. Not perfect about it by any means. But it's important to recognize when you're doing it. So just going slow and thinking about exactly what I want to say before I say it really helps me a lot. Early in my IT career, I know I would always go really fast because I would understand what I'm talking about and I'd be very excited to speak about it. But you know, eventually you realize not everybody's at the same level as you. Things that seem elementary to you very much are advanced to others. So taking it slow, breaking it down, thinking about why you're saying a particular thing, who your audience is, and how they would best hear it, or what words would work best for them, now it's deliberacy is very important in speech, I find, just in general. I don't know what I would start a podcast about, though. Seems like everyone has a podcast these days. Yeah, I've always felt like ADHD, at least for me, has been a double-edged sword. It's obviously an issue when you get sensory overload or, you know, you struggle with paying attention because of current classroom settings not being 
designed to be appropriate for ADHD or other neurodivergent individuals. But on the other hand, it definitely helps in some areas such as um, the IT space because so much of ADHD is uh, stimulus seeking. You know, we're constantly looking for more information. And a lot of IT is just noticing small details that the average person doesn't. You know, when I do this, it creates an error. Okay, but did you notice that over here in the corner, this started flashing red sort of deal? And just being able to take in all of the sensory details from a large screen effortlessly has very much helped me in a lot of aspects of my life. It's very much trivia trivialized uh, a lot of my job. And it's one of the reasons why I'm able to utilize six uh, computer monitors at the same time, because, well, my eyes can quickly flash between them. So, trade-offs. Yeah, I don't even have an IT degree. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies, which is basically, hey, you took so many hundred credit hours or whatever, but you didn't fill out an actual degree path. We're going to give you a degree anyways. I've often wondered if I should go back to college, too. You know. Expand my horizons a little bit more. Especially now that... You know, as an adult, with a stable job, it wouldn't be as stressful. Sure, it'd be a little bit more of a time sink. But... You know, not being afraid that, oh, if I fail this class, my world's going to end. I'm going to be stuck in school for another year or whatever. How did you decide to fail a course, Merlin? Because I failed a number of courses, and none of those were by choice. Well, I suppose, in a sense, they were a choice because I didn't study enough or do the homework well enough, or I let my depression get the better of me, but it's not like I was like, I'm going to get an F in this course. <laughs>
Yeah, no, I, uh, between the gifted kid burnout, the big fish in a small pond syndrome, uh, depression that had gone undiagnosed, I have just said that already, but ADHD and a few other things that were going on. My final years at college were not good to me. Yeah, C++ is, oof. Like, I still do scripting and stuff today, and I can't really wrap my head around C++ courses. Especially since so much of it's talking about, like, baseline computer logic, like pointers and memory allocation. It's just... <sighs> Honestly, I think... Um, colleges need to stop giving C++ and C Sharp as the baseline programming experience. I think they'd do much better if they started to do on a scripting ex uh, language like Python or you know PowerShell to get you a, thinking about the logic first and then get diving deep into the computer system. Yeah, I think I think um, if the intent is to teach uh, logic and not syntax, then stuff like uh, Python is way more appropriate than any of the C's. That said, I have sort of always had an interest in some of the more archaic programming languages. One of these days I'm going to look into COBOL or Fortran. If only so that I can just be like, yeah, I, uh, I'm one of maybe a hundred people that can fix our failing EHR system. <laughs> I was originally going for mechanical engineering, and uh, well, there were some aspects of it I really enjoyed. <sighs> Other parts were just awful to me. Like CAD? I love CAD. I still use CAD today. Uh, Computer-aided drafting, for those who don't know. Basically making 3D models. But multivariate uh, calculus... That can go into the dumpster. I do not want to ever look at that ever again for the rest of my life. Oh, yeah. Assemblies, uh, oof. Oh, boy. The, uh, the first roller coaster tycoon was done entirely in assembly by one man. I still love hearing about how uh, the reason why, um, what's the word I'm looking for, customers at your roller coaster park can die if you shoot them into a 
like a lake or a pond or something is because it was less memory intensive to simply kill them than it was to program a pathing system for them to find their way out of the water. <laughs> oh, this guy's in the water. Better kill him. <laughs> Why are you killing him? Well, because uh, we've only got so many kilobytes of memory to work with. And I am not writing a pathing program. That, uh, the old school programming stories are always so funny to me. Because there's so much of programming that's... So, like, uh, style codes and stuff like that for modern programming are so heavily based in the original limitations of coding. Uh... When you're talking about like memory pointers in C++, it's because you only had a limited number of limited bits of memory, so you had to make sure that you were using all of it to its full potential. So, one uh, uh, story I remember reading was about this junior programmer working on a video game, and he was freaking out because he had gone over his code budget, and he just could not figure out a way to cut it down to the, you know, 2,048 uh, bits that he needed or something like that. And then uh, he finally brings it to his uh, senior in defeat, and he's like, boss, I just can't figure this out. I don't know how to, uh, how to work with this. I, you know, can you show me what to do? And the senior dev looks at it real quick and is like, oh, oh, this is perfect. Just delete the buffer. What buffer? Oh, right, you're new here. So uh, whenever we start a project, we put in uh, 300 uh, bytes of buffer code. Uh, and that's just so that when you get to the end of the project, if you're over by 300 bytes, you just delete that old code, and then you're done. <laughs> what? Yeah, no. Uh, just delete these lines here and you're good to go. It's just the idea that, you know, having to build in that buffer to mentally train yourself to go under budget. <laughs> it's just funny. But yeah, little tricks like that, that we just don't really have a modern counterpart for stuff like that, except in the way that we just think about programming, or how we teach programming even. And thanks for stopping on by there, Keld. Hope you have a good rest of your day, and uh, hope to see you on one of our next streams. I think we're pretty much done with edge highlighting at this point, at least with the silver. Just kind of going through the motions on this model here. But I think the next thing I need to do is figure out exactly, because for these guys, I think they're all set. I think these immortals turned out pretty nicely. I'll just give them some varnish later once they're completely dry. And uh, we're going to do like matte varnish on the metal parts and gloss varnish on the green bits to make sure they really shine. But I think this guy's still missing a lot of little detail that we could fill in.
like uh, these little orbs on his cape and loincloth here. The uh, symbols, bits on his scythe here. A lot we can work with. I'll just do a couple more minor edge highlights on this guy and then we'll take a look at what paint we have available. Maybe we can do like a copper inlay for the uh, for the cape there. Maybe a dark copper, very burnished to contrast with the bright silver that this uh, this guy got. Everybody remember to rehydrate, get a little bit of a stretch in, while I take a look at my medals. Yeah, so I've got some glorious gold, polished gold, bright bronze, brassy brass, hammered copper, and tinny tin. This brassy brass is a good color, but I think it's a bit bright. I don't want this guy too shiny. I think maybe this hammered copper will tone it down enough without being too out of the place. It's either that or we go back to the bronze color that I already used on these pieces. I mean, we can already tell that it's a good looking color. And maybe we should give that a try instead. Keep things consistent. It's still got that nice deep orange, but it's actually kind of in between there. And because this is an army painter paint, don't have to worry about thinning it because it's already naturally really thin. Although I might still just give it a little bit of the contrast medium. Just enough to make it flow better. Now then, where did I put my number one brush? Because I don't want number two on this. But I do want a little bit more paint load than a zero. There we are. So this will help us do the fine detail while still Also letting us do a lot at once. There we go. That's a nice consistency for that. Then we're just going to go through the tedious task of filling in each of these little orbs. Uh, before we continue, I'm just going to grab another one of these little medicine cups. Make it a little easier to hold on to.
No. I feel that, uh, there, Merlin. I've definitely been sniffly all this, uh, past few weeks myself. I love the 70 degree temperature, the colors, the gentle breezes. Hate, hate, hate the allergies. Hate being sniffly or waking up with my uh, nose all clogged up. And of course, all the sinus headaches that come with it, too. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I need to stock up on uh, that 24-hour stuff. The Claritin. It's been really weird of a fall this year up in this area because we've had a few 40-degree days already. But this weekend, it's all the way back up to like 75 again. Consistency is not our strong point. Can't say I know what POTS is. I mean, the weather shifts really hurt my, uh, my arthritis. Postural tachycardia syndrome. Well, I know tachycardia, that's, uh, intermittent heartbeat. But I don't know what postural means in this context. Ah, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, no, I can't imagine that is uh, fun waking up to your heart beating out of control for no reason. Oh dear. No bueno. Yeah, usually my, my arthritis are, the arthritis symptoms are manageable with a little bit of aspirin or just stretching it out and working it. But some days I just wake up and I cannot bend my hands at all because the pressure dropped, the weather did a 40 degree shift and I am useless that entire day. Not as bad as my sister-in-law. She has an autoimmune form of arthritis, despite only being uh, in her early 30s. 
but when the weather changes, she, uh, I could hear her waking up in the next room, like her bones creaking and popping so loudly you could hear them through the walls sort of deal. It was heartbreaking to hear. She is much happier back in Korea where they have a much more stable weather system than up here in Michigan. Yeah, she uh, she's a writer as well as a teacher, and the days that she couldn't type, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, the pain alone would be enough to stop any normal person from, you know, working on their book or anything. But to physically be unable to type when that's your passion. That is, like, pure misery. But she's doing better now. She is a self-published author. Give this all at the top of the spine, too. A little bit of the bronzing. I think uh, something else I'm going to do with this model. And I'm done with all of the metallic. Is take some of my existing black wash and dilute it even further with um, the flow improver surfactant to make a, a very light wash and just go over the entire model with it so that it doesn't dampen anything too much, but it does seep into the recesses and also take a little bit of the shine off. Because even though this guy is, you know, the fanciest of them, I think he still needs a little bit more grunge than he currently has. Just a little too shiny for a undead robot. I think these little tassels here, they could use a little bit of bronzing. I may have asked this before, but Merlin, have you ever done any uh, miniature painting? Huh. I'll tell you what. If you ever come up this way, I'll give you your first crash course in it. And send you home with some extra minis to try out. Because, you know, the first taste is always free, and then you get into uh, the habit and realize that you're going to be spending 
$300 on uh, paints and plastic. Ah, Gunpla. That's always fun. Oop, got distracted. Luckily, I caught myself. Yeah, I've done a little bit of Gunpla myself. That's a lot more assembly and a lot less painting. Though, I do know some people who will reprime their models and do custom paint jobs on them. They turn out pretty interesting. And they're actually a pretty good uh, place to start when you want to learn the basics of sprue cutting and assembly, I think. Because you're usually working with much larger, less detailed parts. A lot of press fit, so you don't have to worry about glue just yet unless you want to make certain joints permanent, etc., etc. Also, some of the models are just really cool looking. I'll get done uh, painting these little circles real quick and show some of mine off. Uh, let me just hit this tassel real quick, too, so I don't waste any paint. All right, put my brush in water real quick. So this here is one of my favorite Gundams. It's uh, in the show, it doesn't really get as much love but this is called the R75, RX-75 Gun Tank. It's definitely one of those early models of Gundam where it was like, yeah, we'll just make it like a really big tank, right? Before, you know, they turned into actual, like, humanoid fighting suits. The thing that I love the most about uh, this model is, like, this person is sitting in this cockpit here. So you would imagine that these guns are, like, huge. According to the official spec sheets, these are uh, 122 uh, millimeter guns, which are actually pretty standard to contemporary infantry guns uh, and artillery guns of today. 122 millimeters is only, like, 5 inches. So while these, the bore of these cannons are the size of a human, they're only supposed to be five inches. <laughs> it's just, Gundam doesn't really take itself seriously enough to get little details like that correct. But I think they're cute. And of course, you've got models like this where it's literally just a guy with the lightsaber. Because why not? Lightsaber and a jetpack. Oh yeah, dioramas are always fun to do. I should really do some uh, dioramas with my tank models.
I'll have to take a look at that Instagram now after I'm done here. I think this is really coming together nice. A little breaking up of the monotony with this copperish bronze is really doing it for me. And the question is how much further do I want to go with it because it makes it a good accent color, but I don't know if I want to spread it too heavily to anything else. I might come back in here and like at these joint pieces where you can tell there's a little difference of what's going on in the you know skeletal system that they have. Maybe do a darker gunmetal instead of a contrasting copper. Just to break it up a little bit more but not be too obtrusive. But for now, do a little bit more fine detailing on this cape. Go back over some other areas. Nothing like picking out tiny one millimeter wide details. With just the tip of your brush. Well, if it's coffee time, it's coffee time. Go get yourself some coffee.
Drink a cup for me too. All right, I think we're good on copper for now. So I think we're gonna grab our gun metal again and bring down the value on some of these lower joint bits. <laughs> make you go do things I can't make you do anything the power to do things is inside yourself Besides, you've got plenty of time between now and dinner. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I know that feeling. Oh, so what you're saying is you want me to end the stream early so that you'll go do things. I guess we'd be ending late, but you know what I mean. Oh, it looks like these guys have a little ball bit on the back of their racers. I'll have to hit that with the copper again. For consistency, of course. There we go. Now while we're at it. Hit this part of the spear. The scythe real quick. Mm, you can tell I've been painting for over two hours because I'm getting really shaky. Doesn't help that I'm using cups instead of my holder, but you know. I think we'll have to wrap up pretty soon. Been going on nearly three hours now. Miller agrees. Yes, yes, D shrimp. <sighs> Y'all and calling me out on my wrists all the time. You overwork your wrists one time while working on a desert project and you'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> Did 
just because I'm super self-destructive. All right, I think we're looking pretty good. And I think I'm gonna call it there for the day because we're coming right up on that three hour mark and I need to get ready to go have dinner with my grandparents. So thank you all for stopping by. Hope you enjoyed the painting today. Let's see if there's anybody I can throw you to. Yeah, it looks like Kalooner Jade's doing some Donut County. That's fun. We'll toss you over there. Again, thanks for coming along. Hope you enjoyed what you saw. And, uh, you know, y'all have a good rest of your weekend. Spread the love around. Do something nice for yourself. All that good stuff. And we'll see you on Monday. Have a good one.